hopefully that'll work. Hello, anyone who might already be watching on Facebook. We will get started in a few minutes. And I wanted to say hello to our panelists who have already joined. I would like to do a quick sound check to make sure that everybody's microphone is um, working. Um, Dr. Turner and Virginia, we've already heard from you. Allison, could you just say a quick hello? Hi there. Sound great. And then Bill, could you say a quick hello? Yep, hi, this is Bill. Hi, thanks everyone. All right, we're gonna go back on mute and we'll get started in about five minutes or so, thank you. Hello, um, I am, can you guys hear me okay? I'm trying to get my video to start. Hi, Laura, yes, we can hear you. Okay, um, I'm not sure what's happening. I just did a, oh, there we go. Go. Has worked in previous Zooms.
Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for this special event, the next 100 Days for Democracy. I am Dr. Deborah Ann Turner, Board President of the League of Women Voters of the United States. For those who aren't familiar with the League of Women Voters, we are a grassroots nonpartisan organization that has worked to empower voters and defend democracy for more than a century. We are active in all 50 states, the District of Columbia, and the Virgin Islands, with more than 750 leagues and communities across the country. Our membership is open to everyone aged 16 and above, regardless of voting status or gender identity. There has never Never been a more critical time in the history of our nation to fight to, to protect our democracy. The right to vote is the backbone of our democracy and the League is working hard to ensure that our Republic remains strong and the freedom to vote is upheld for all. In the 2020 elections, the League helped more than 6 million voters find inform information they needed through our comprehensive election site, vote411.org. For the first time, our election resources, including candidate voter guides, were also available in Spanish. Through our voting rights litigation, the League protected more than 25 million voters by expanding absentee ballot deadlines, eliminating witness signature requirements, expanding no excuse absentee ballot, ballot voting, <clears throat> extending voter registration deadlines, relaxing voter ID requirements, and much more. Our impact directly ensured that more Americans than ever were able to make their voices heard through their votes. Yet, in the seven months since election day, we have seen hundreds of anti-voter bills introduced in state legislatures across the country. These bills present a clear and present danger to America's freedom to cast ballots in future elections. They illustrate why the League's de dedication to fighting against voter disenfranchisement is more important than ever. We all know when everyone can participate in free and fair elections, our elected officials better represent our communities and our government is truly by and for the people. So the phrase, for the people, it is a statement that clearly defines American democracy. Currently, there is a critically important bill making its way through Congress the For the People Act. The bill is a priority of the League. It is a comprehensive piece of legislation that will strengthen American democracy for decades to come. The bill protects the right to vote, eliminates dark money in elections, restores transparency in government, and ends partisan and racial gerrymandering. The League worked with members of Congress to shape key pieces of the For the People Act, including expanding automatic same-day and online voter registration. The League is also prioritizing another bill currently before Congress, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. In 2013, the Supreme Court rolled back key provisions of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. This which protected Americans against racial discrimination in voting and gerrymandering. Since then, we have seen increasing voter discrimination against people of color. It is especially critical that we restore the Voting Rights Act this year because in a few short months, the redistricting process will begin. This will be the first redistricting cycle without the full protections of the Voting Rights Act. The John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act is the key to ensuring communities of color do not lose their voting power through district maps designed to silence their voices. For today's discussion, we will hear from a panel of three accomplished Senate staffers who are working hard to protect our democracy. There will be time to take some questions from the public at the end of the presentations, so please use the comments feature to ask your questions and our team will collect them. Now, before I hand things over to our distinguished moderator, the CEO of the League of Women Voters, Virginia K. Solomon, we have a special message from Senate Majority Leader Schumer. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today and a special thank you to our senators and congressional staff for their commitment to making democracy work. Hi everyone, this is Senator Chuck Schumer and thank you to the League of Women Voters, especially all of you tuning in from New York for inviting me to join today's virtual democracy panel. Just over a hundred years ago, Congress passed the 19th Amendment, extending the franchise to women for the first time in our nation's history. Today, I'm excited to discuss a simple but urgent question. 
What will our democracy look like 100 years from now? A few months ago, we celebrated the start of a new administration and we turned the page from a president who pushed our democracy to the absolute horrible limit, culminating in an armed surrection at the US Capitol fueled by Donald Trump's big lie. Now, Republican state legislatures have seized on the big lie and are passing a rash of voter suppression laws, the greatest contraction of voting rights we've seen since the end of Reconstruction and the beginning of Jim Crow. These laws deliberately target all the ways that poorer, younger, and non-white Americans typically access the ballot. So while we've come a long way since 2020 in the 19th Amendment, the struggle for voting rights in this century is just beginning. That's why it's so important we take action on S-1, the For the People Act. Democrats have made this bill a top priority and named it Senate Bill Number 1, S-1, for a reason. It's about the future of our democracy. It would halt the voter suppression attempts at the state level. It would make it easier for people to register to vote. It would combat foreign interference in our elections, get rid of the dark money, and so much more. The American people are calling on us to make these changes. And we are going to work like hell over the next few weeks and months to take action. I need all of you to join us in this effort. Reach out to your senators, demand action on S-1. Let's make clear, especially to our Republican members, that these attacks on our democracy cannot stand and that history will not be kind to those who choose to stand with voter suppression instead of voter rights. Together, I'm confident we will defend our democracy and keep it. So thank you. Thank you all and my very best. Thank you, Senator Majority Leader Schumer for those very powerful words and to Dr. Turner for your welcoming remarks. Hi everyone, I am Virginia K. Solomon. I am the CEO of the League of Women Voters of the United States and it is my honor and pleasure to lead this discussion with you today. We have true, three truly impressive congressional staffers here with us for this discussion. Allison Hun is the policy advisor and counsel for Senator Merkley of Oregon. In that role, Allison focuses on the economy and democracy reform. And specifically, she leads the Senator's work on the For the People Act. Prior to joining the Hill, she worked in El Paso, Texas as National Policy Chief of Staff for Beto O'Rourke's presidential bid. Allison previously served as a legal policy analyst for the litigation nonprofit Democracy Forward and in the Obama administration's White House Office of Cabinet Affairs. However, Allison is a creature of presidential campaign, so before her time at the White House, she worked on President Obama's 2012 re-election campaign in Chicago and spent her time at law, spent a semester at law school in Brooklyn working for Hillary Clinton's 2016 campaign. Allison received her JD from the University of California, Berkeley School of Law, and holds a BA from the University of Virginia, where she graduated Phi Beta Kappa. Welcome, Allison. Next up, we have Bill Van Horn, who is the chief counsel for Senator Ben Cardin of Maryland. He previously worked as a policy analyst for the Maryland General Assembly in Annapolis. And Bill holds a Bachelor of Arts in Science from in Political Science from John Hopkins University and graduated with a JD from the University of Maryland School of Law. And then finally, we have Laura Peterson. Laura is the legislative counsel for Senator Tester of Montana. She has worked for, Senate, for the Senator since 2016 and served as counsel since 2019. She currently works on judiciary, homeland security, and democracy issues for the Senator's office, including the Senator's effort to, on camp, efforts on campaign finance reform and voter protection. She is originally from Little Rock, Rock, Arkansas, and is a graduate of the University of Arkansas School of Law. Thank you all so much for being here today. I am so excited for this conversation. And I also want to say thank you to our audience um, for joining us. We're going to have some time for Q&A at the end. So we do ask folks to please put your questions in the comments. Um, and I'm just really looking forward to this discussion. So why don't we just go ahead and dive right in? Um, 
first question number one, and I think um, what I'll do is I'll just ask, uh, I'll start with you, Allison, and then Bill and Laura, I'd love for you guys to chime in. Um, and the first one really is around the For the People Act. Senator Schumer just alluded to the fact that S1, the For the People Act, is a priority for us right now. Um, we've seen so many challenges to our democracy over the past several years, and in particular over the past year, it's been really challenging. Um, but the For the People Act, it has broad bipartisan support from voters around the country. And the Voting Rights Act has always been reauthorized with bipartisan support. But we're seeing things that are a little bit different right now and there are more challenges and it's become um, much harder for this work to move forward. So what we'd like to know first is how organizations like the League can work to engage voters across the country to show support for democracy legislation. Thank you so much, Virginia, for having us. Um, this is just a, a really exciting time to be here and to be discussing the For the People Act and all the other legislation um, on democracy issues. You know, I think you said it exactly right. There is broad bipartisan support for many of the provisions that are captured in the For the People Act. And I think it's also worth reminding folks that so much of what's in the For the People Act has bipartisan origins. I mean, there were I think I can cite 10 recent bipartisan commissions that offered many of the recommendations that are captured in this bill, be it expanded vote by mail, be it no excuse absentee, expanded early voting. I mean, there's so many common sense reforms that are, that are captured here that have bipartisan support. It, this really shouldn't be an issue of, you know, one party versus the other. This is meant to expand access for all Americans to reach the ballot box. So I, I really appreciate you raising this question. I think, you know, as, as we're thinking about ways for members of the league to get involved and educate voters, it, it's worth emphasizing these bipartisan origins and, and talking about the fact that, um, you know, so much of this is, is just a way to make it easier for folks to go to the ballot box without having to find childcare, without having to take off work, without having to face so many obstacles that are in place and, and really shouldn't be there. So I, I think, you know, emphasizing the, the Bauer Ginsburg Commission or, or talking about the work that the American Academy of Arts and Sciences has done to just say this is easy. These are easier ways to make it vote, to make it make folks able to vote, um, I, I think are great points to start with. And I'd certainly recommend um, recognize Bill and Laura for any other thoughts that they may have. Yeah, I have a follow up question, actually, Bill, that I'm hoping that you can or help elaborate a little bit more on, because it's not just organizations like the League, but it's everyday people who, in some cases, have kind of tuned out because it's been so it's, it's been a lot the past year. Right. And so how do we get people engaged and excited again, especially when there are so many pressing issues people are worried about? you know, housing eviction, you know, being lifted soon, and people are worried about getting back to work and so many other things. How do we keep democracy front and center on people's mind while make, making sure that we know these other things are important too? Right, that's right. Well, thanks, Virginia, again, thanks to League of Women Voters for hosting and for Deborah for those introductory remarks. Uh, I think you're right, uh, Virginia and, and Allison, this is a critical moment in our democracy, and we have been through a very difficult time with the ongoing pandemic over the last year. I do think the pandemic, though, has highlighted for people what's important for them, right? So what are the issues that are important for them and their families and for the democracy? Uh, so my hope is we can talk about that in the context of S1 and voting rights and steps that we can take, uh, you know, to improve access to the vote. So I think you're right. We have made some changes in the last year. For example, you know, in Maryland and other states, we made it easier for people to vote by mail. We increased the hours uh, for voting. We uh, made it easier to register and get access to the ballot because we didn't want people to choose between right their health and casting a secure vote or as Allison said to choose between child care and voting right or, or working on their job or getting time off so we should continue to look at that flexibility as we come out of the pandemic here and go ahead and 
uh, formalize some of these changes we made, you know, in the last year. Uh, and my, my other point would be that all the issues you're raising in Virginia in terms of the issues we're working on, the voting rights is fundamental, right? So you have to have voting rights. You have to have an engaged citizenry, people who have the legal right to vote. You've got to protect their right to vote. If you want to make progress, if we're working on, you know, immigration or gun safety or environment or healthcare, you name it, that's fundamental. So we're working on something that's the foundation of our democracy. You've got to have that access. We should be making it easier for people to vote, not harder. And that's something I know Senator Cardin and the members here and the leader Schumer has been talking about the reaction to the 2020 election. Usually, normally people say, hey, how do we bring in more people? But unfortunately, on the other side, we've seen efforts to do voter suppression or disenfranchise. And maybe we'll talk about the states later as well. So that's definitely the wrong direction for this country. I think most people know that. And you're right, there is support for S1. Uh, so we look forward to working with the league and, and broadening that coalition. There's a large coalition of groups working on S1. And again, on the specific subject matter areas, this is the key for, for things we're trying to get done in this Congress. So we would look forward to working with the league and a larger coalition on that. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate that. And I think that's really a, a, a good point. And that kind of segues me into um, Laura. Uh, um, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts, but a little bit of a twist on it as well. Um, I think you have a really great perspective um, on rural communities, right? People have this idea that somehow it's just the coasts that care about this, East Coast, West Coast, right? But you bring another perspective in your work as well for some of the, what, obviously where you grew up, but also where the, the where you um, are working to represent and support um, Senator Tester's constituents, and so can you um, even if you won't mind, and I'm interested in hearing your your thoughts on the original question, but also a little bit about why it matters to everybody. This is not just an East Coast West Coast kind of thing, right? Um, you know, I. I thought I understood what rule meant growing up in Arkansas, um, but it only takes um, a couple drives across the great state of Montana to realize that I had no idea what a long distance um, and what rule really meant. And I think it is critical to understand that, you know, we talk about all these voting reforms, but I think of same day registration. You have folks that have to drive miles to go register to vote. We shouldn't make them have to make that trip twice. Um, first time voters, um, it should be convenient. They shouldn't have to take time off of work um, to, to have to choose between, you know, making their shift and having their voice heard at the ballot box. Um, so you have to think about, the, and, and this is the same for families on the coast as well. You know, um, families are busy um, and voting should be, um, it should be safe, but it should also be convenient. It shouldn't be difficult to have your voice heard at the ballot box. So I think it, and I also think of, you know, our native voters in Montana, our rural voters and, and how um, we should be making it easier, not harder for them to vote going back to what Bill was saying. No, that's really great. I appreciate that. And I, I appreciate you pointing out the fact that, um, you know, even just something as simple as a voter ID law that can make it difficult for people, especially in hard financial times or having to go back and forth to a motor vehicle when sometimes your closest motor vehicle might be two hours away from where you live. And so there are so many challenges. I guess, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, Laura, I'll start with you and then go backwards this time. The threats to our democracy now are, are great. I mean, we have fought, the league last year alone filed 70, I think 72 lawsuit, lawsuits um, because of anti-voting rights um, pieces of legislation or people just trying to prevent people from being able to vote. And we're continuing to file lawsuits. We filed a lawsuit in Arkansas uh, just, I mean, I'm sorry, in Kansas just yesterday. And so we are just nonstop, we feel like we're, always putting up this wall to make sure that we're holding that defensive line for voters. Um, and we've seen these attacks. And so the, the question really is, um, what do you see as the greatest threat to our democracy right now today, if you could pick one thing? And the same question for each of you, what is the one thing that you, you know, concerns you the most or keeps you up at night? I mean, in addition to the just the the practical attacks we're seeing, I mean, I think of 
of dark money and and there's the flood of money we're seeing into our system for campaigns but also you know against the for the people act um we're just seeing this flood and it muddies the water and makes it so voters you know we need voters to know who they're voting for what policies are there who's supporting candidates and why and i think that's the thing, and, and, and Senator Tester reiterates this all the time, that you know we need to make sure that folks can show up and they know who and what they're voting for. Those have to go hand in hand. So um, you know, in addition to the direct vote, I just, I just look at all of the dark money and the amount of influence that's kind of just flooding our system and really muttering our waters. That, that, that's the thing that comes to mind for me. Bill, what about you? Uh, one of the worries I have besides what, what Laura said is this kind of under deliberate undermining of democracy and election results by elected officials. I just think that's reprehensible, wrong, you know, despicable, pick your adjective there. Uh, so when elected leaders are, you know, as Leader Schumer talked about, kind of peddling the big lie, that's wrong and they should know better. And you shouldn't for political purposes try to undermine their election results just because you lost in a free and fair election. So that worries me because I do think that corrodes, you know, the democracy, the fact that we're all in this together, you have a debate, you have an election, you win and you lose, then you get down to governing, would be nice for a few years, right? That does worry me if people are saying that the whole system is rigged and then that's the justification for voter suppression, right? Or having uh, certain people that are more political certify the results versus as a secretary of state. So that's something I am concerned about. And I think the league again can help with that with, with voting rights and other groups is to get that civic engagement back. We had great turnout in 2020. Let's do that again in 2022. And then also defend our democracy and say, we are gonna defend it. We are gonna have a free and fair election. And just cause we're gonna, if someone's not happy with the result we're not gonna say, oh, we need to throw out the results or it wasn't fair. Uh, Senator Cardin does a lot of foreign policy work as well. And so we work on working with democracies and those in transition and one of the key is kind of a peaceful transfer of power, accepting the results and having that as a norm. Uh, and so that's something we need to watch in the United States as well as we preach that around the world. And obviously January 6th was, it was a dark moment for us. So I think that is a warning sign uh, going into the 2022 election. So that's what I, I tend to worry about. I appreciate that. And, and I think both of these are really good examples of things that I know I, everything keeps me up at night these days, but um, those are two really great examples. And Allison, I'm, I'm curious about where, where you, what you think about. Absolutely. I mean, I wholeheartedly agree with Laura and Bill, what they've shared. You know, I do worry though, fundamentally about the fact that we're seeing hundreds of bills introduced in states, but we're also seeing, you know, more, over a dozen enacted. I think the Brennan Center released a statistic, I think it was last week, that as of May 14th, there were 14 states having enacted 22 new laws that restrict the right to vote. So, you know, it's not only conceptual at this point, there, there are, you know, forces in effect that are fundamentally restricting these rights. And there was a Daily Beast article that came out a couple weeks ago now that really talked about the coordination that's going behind um, these various laws of different states. So it, there, you know, there is a concerted effort that, that really um, makes me quite concerned um, because you know, there, there's certainly a ripple effect here too as you're, as you're you know, drawing districts within states, as you're impacting who is uh, elected into both your local and your, or your state legislature and your federal representatives. There's just so many impacts on where um, power is, is shifting. And so, you know, wanting to ensure that power remains with the people, with the, with the voters is, is fundamental. And I, I worry about our ability to do that as these laws go into effect. And that's why for the people is, is so important in so many ways. Yeah, and I think one of the things for us, and I appreciate each of those responses. Um, I know we're going to be segueing over to the next section of our discussion, but you know, the league has historically been one of the challenges we have as an organization is we are a nonpartisan organization in that we don't support or endorse candidates or political parties. Um, we were born out of the suffrage movement, fighting for the right to vote. And um, voting has always been at the core, at the center, and democracy has always been at the core and the center of everything that the league does. Um, and while people, you know, depending on, on 
what decade you're in, people either love us or hate us, right? And we're okay with that because we've always remained focused on the work. Um, but democracy has never not been a bipartisan topic. There's been debates on policy, there have been debates on how to get there. And so this has been become a very hyper-partisan moment and one that even organizations like ours have found ourselves perplexed, right? Because this is something new for us. And so um, I think that's one of the things for me that keeps me up at night is just all of these issues are have been framed in a partisan way and while they are political they shouldn't be partisan democracy is a core central um you know that is the fundamental of who we are as, as, as a country and so it's it's been a challenge um so I, I really appreciate you all for, 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 for this discussion. We're gonna take a short break from our panel to hear now from Senator Merkley, but we will be back with some final remarks and to take your questions. Greetings to all the members and supporters of the League of Women Voters participating in this virtual congressional reception. I'm Oregon Senator Jeff Merkley. Congratulations on your 100 years of advocacy for the integrity of American elections. And thank you for the invitation to discuss what democracy should look like over the next 100 years. No small assignment. As we think about the next 100 years, the question we face is, do we want government of, by, and for the people or government of, by, and for the powerful? The goal we should aim for in the immediate future and the next 100 years is government of, by, and for the people. And as an organization, I think you certainly share that vision. And that means defending the freedom to vote for every American, that we knock down any barriers erected to prevent targeted communities from voting. We need to end gerrymandering, the redrawing of congressional lines to favor one party over the other, which is a direct assault on equal representation. We need to stop billionaires from buying elections by shining a light on the hundreds of millions of dollars of dark money in campaigns. And we need to stop the corruption that stems from conflicts of interest so that elected leaders serve the public, not private parties. To secure this vision, we need to pass this year S1, the For the People Act. I'm the lead sponsor of the bill and it defends the freedom of every American to vote. It stops billionaires from buying elections. It ends gerrymandering and it eliminates conflicts of interest. Passage of this bill is urgent because right now over a dozen states have just within this last month enacted laws targeted at black Americans, minority communities, native Americans and college students to make it harder for them to vote. And by doing so to change the outcome of elections. It's like we're in a time machine and we're returning to pre-1965 before we passed the Voting Rights Act. I think most of us thought that could never ever happen, that any elected leader in this day and age would obstruct the right and freedom of Americans to participate in elections. But clearly it is happening right now. This is a struggle between those two visions between that vision of government of, by, and for the people and of, by, and for the powerful. This is the point. We have to pass this bill this year or our fundamental vision of our Republic will be damaged for a generation. And in addition to passing for the people, we need to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, a pre-clearance bill it says you cannot change your laws to make it harder for specific groups to vote. So before you change your laws, you have to get changes to your voting laws approved. Together, these two laws will set the foundation for the integrity of the vision of our constitution, which is power flows up from the people, not down from the powerful. Passing these bills will not be easy. The Senate is split 50-50. I have 49 members of the Democratic Party as sponsors, but I don't have 50. And in addition, policy bills are subject to 60 votes to close debate in the Senate. And Republican leadership has been very clear they will not help us protect these fundamental rights. In fact, they've dedicated themselves to obstructing efforts to defend these fundamental rights. So we not only need 50 votes and the vice president to pass these important bills, but also we have to stop Minority Leader Mitch McConnell from blocking that vote. Carrie Chapman Catt, who founded the League of Women Voters, believed wholeheartedly in this notion. She said, 
Everybody counts in applying democracy until every responsible and law-abiding adult in it, without regard to race, sex, color, or creed, has his or her own inalienable and unpurchasable voice in government. Let's work together to safeguard our democracy by passing the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act to ensure that every single American has their own inalienable and unpurchasable voice in our government. Thank you so much, Senator Merkley. We really appreciate those comments. Um, you know, powerful words, unpurchasable vote. Um, I think about that when I think about money in politics and politics and, and that is probably one of the biggest challenges. And I think one of the things we didn't get a chance to really talk to talk about today is Citizens United, obviously, um, in that decision. but. But before we take questions from our digital audience, I want to ask each of our panelists to share some final words. And in the theme of our event today, I'd like to ask each of you what you think democracy will look like 100 years from now. And this is not the final question. We do have audience questions. So I ask that you do stick around after that. But, but again, what do you think democracy will look like 100 years from now? Or what do you hope it will look like? Um, and we'll start with Allison. Thanks so much, Virginia. You know, I, I think what's tricky about that question is that so much of it, I think, hinges on what the Senate is able to accomplish. And so, you know, coming in with an optimistic uh, perspective that I think I have. I think passage of the For the People Act, which includes Senator Cardin's Deceptive Practices Act and includes the campaign finance reforms that um, Senator Tester is such a strong champion of and includes, you know, ethics provisions that are, are common sense and that just need to be codified. I think that there is, you know, a real hope that we have a, a transparent government uh, with accountable members uh, that really are representing the policy priorities of, of the people and that and that folks can vote without obstacle in a hundred years. And I think, you know, a, a, I guess a full enfranchisement of eligible voters is really the dream. And I think that that's something we can accomplish in the next hundred years uh, with, with the work of, you know, strong members and advocates like yourselves. So that's, that's my goal. I agree. That would be a great goal to, for me personally to finally see the dream fully realized, right? Um, Laura, how about you? I, I mean, everything that Allison said, um, I think full, um, you know, every um, eligible voter being able to safely and conveniently have their voice heard at the ballot box. You know, I think of how everything just changed in this last year and what we were looking forward in just the next few months, if not years, I think this will really set the trajectory. Um, but I think of, you know, folks in rural communities not having to travel for, you know, hours or even just a few, you know, stand, no more standing in line, no more long drives to the ballot box. Um, and that's what I see. I see I see more participation. I think that's also, there are some positives that we have to look at. It's groups like the league who have gotten more and more people, more young people involved. Um, so I see a lot of, I hope, enthusiasm around voting and, and hopefully um, a few victories in our fight. Thank you, Laura. And Bill, 100 <laughs> I, years from now, when we're, right. <laughs> when, we're, when we're still doing this work, right? Right. <laughs> Yes, uh, I agree with everything Allison and Laura said. I think they said it very well. Um, and I am hopeful, just picking up on Laura's last point, that you know, with the increases in technology too, wouldn't it be nice if we could use that to make it easier to vote and exchange information and have uh, you know citizenry with, with the internet and communications and what will happen in the next century that is more well-informed and can tap more directly into the democracy. So I do see technology as a positive here. As Allison said, though, we also have to watch out for deceptive practices, immense information, you know, voter suppression using using targeted means. So it's two sides of a coin there. But I, I do hope for a fully engaged citizen 
industry uh, that has access to vote. And then the, I guess the other plug I put in from a federalism point of view is, as, as you've noted, Virginia and, and Deborah, we do have to pay attention to our state capitals as well. And so I do hope there's kind of state and local involvement that goes with what goes along with what we're doing in Congress. Because again, under our current system, that is a shared responsibility in terms of federal state responsibility. So I'd like to see our state and local, you know, county and, and municipal, very local uh, folks get involved too and to set, um, you know, make it easier for people to vote and to be, you know, cognizant of that as we're working with the states as well. Uh, so that would be my hope for the next uh, next century here. All good stuff. And Dr. Turner, my wonderful board president, I'm interested in what you think, because um, I think the members also would be interested in hearing your vision for democracy 100 years from now. Thank you, Virginia, and thank you to all our amazing panelists here. And I'm going to go back to a fundamental. I obviously agree with everybody about making sure that we have everybody enfranchised to vote. But I think it starts with the basics of our children and education. I really believe that if we want a electorate that is engaged and is willing to and able to vote and build an incredible democracy, we have to really start looking at how we're educating our children and what they're learning. Their civic education and their, they're going to have an obligation to want to have a strong democracy. So I'm very much one of those people who says, my parents always told me when I was younger, get your education, that's the only thing they can't take away. And if you have your education, you'll know how to vote and they won't take your vote away. So I'm looking for an America that has a fully enfranchised electorate with fully educated electorate also. Thank you, Dr. Turner. So we still have a few more questions that have come in. And I think what I'll do is just instead of having, I'll, I'll pick and choose who gets to answer which one. But one of the first ones that I'm hoping, um, Bill, why don't you take this one? Because this was, you just alluded to this a little bit when it comes to state laws. One of our um, audience members asked, how would the for the how would the passage of the For the People Act impact state laws making their way through state legislatures? So people are really aren't aren't really clear what's the difference between the state laws and the federal laws and what would happen when when For the People is is passed. Right. Well, I'll start out and then you'll you'll Allison too as well on this. I think, you know, at the federal level, we are trying to have kind of minimum standards in terms of access and getting people the right to vote. We've done that with voting rights and civil rights laws too, since the Reconstruction Amendments and the Voting Rights Act. So we'd like to make sure people have, you know, access and, and meeting federal minimum standards and access to the ballot. I think we have a number of provisions in there on, you know, being able to mail in vote and early voting, same day registration. We think these are all improvements that have been made, particularly in the pandemic over the last year, as, as Laura was talking about, that make it easier to vote. Uh, and then I think also with, with S1, but with the John Lewis voting rights or authorization, we want to give DOJ and the Justice Department those tools back in the box so it can combat efforts of voter suppression where you're deliberately trying to restrict the right to vote. Uh, and with the new uh, Biden administration, the Justice Department, I do expect they're going to enforce voting rights acts uh, more uh, broadly and more aggressively. So I think you're going to have some additional tools if we can pass these two pieces of legislation uh, that you'll have a better federal role again to watch out for voter suppression and what we saw kind of in Jim Crow and post reconstruction, uh, but also yield to yield to Allison and Laura on that one. No, I appreciate that. And I, um, I have another question and Laura, I'm hoping maybe you can answer this one for us. Um, People, one of the audience members is asking a question around campaign finance reform and money in politics. And so the question is, what is the most important provision or what change would be in this legislation that would have an impact on getting dark money out of politics? So I think there are, are two big ones I can think of. It's the increased disclosures for, think, for PACs and corporations. Um, making it easier to understand where these big dollars are going towards and what issues they're you know promoting or fighting or or standing for i think those you know 
voters being easily able to access that information of where, you know, we hear of these millions and millions of dollars being spent. Voters should be able to know where that's being funneled to. It shouldn't be secretive. Um, and then I think too, we can't forget about some of the smaller things that are in this bill, like increased disclosure on digital advertising. Um, something that, you know, we're still seeing the impacts of social media on our elections. And, you know, that that should also be easy and that should help voters understand who's responsible for those ads, what groups, who's purchasing these. So th those are the two big campaign finance provisions I, I think of when I think of the For the People Act. Thank you. And I think that's something that a lot of folks maybe, um, especially if you're not a democracy wonk or somebody who's like really into this the way that we are, um, a lot of folks are just trying to figure out what's in there and so we want to be able to make sure that people know this this is what it means it's not this big scary piece of legislation that's actually going to take away anything from anybody if anything it creates more transparency so mm -hmm. that we can see through what's happening um allison a question for you um and i have all these questions coming in so excuse me if i'm looking down i want to make sure i'm getting them right but um you know the big lie it's there. Um, and the mis and disinformation has just come, it's been rampant, right? And even now, today, not even just, you know, it's post election. Um, we have another midterm coming up in 2022. I think um, we all know that um, not only the big lie, but so much of the mis and disinformation that it's not going away, right? Um, so, how do we work? with folks to make sure that we don't want to just be combating lie, but we want to be perpetuating truths. How can we do a better job of that, whether it's through different pieces of legislation or whether it's through, you know, who needs to be involved? Because it's a big complex problem that I know you can't answer in 60 seconds, but I'm just curious on, on what your thoughts are, because there's always a next election coming. Absolutely. And I, I wish I, I wish I had the answers. I mean, it is something that I think is concerning to every American. But, you know, I think what is really um, a first step in importance is is passing these ethics provisions in the For the People Act in order to restore trust in government. I think so much of the big lie has taken hold because people just don't trust their elected officials or there's not the transparency that they feel they need um, in order to, you know, to to trust in the procedure and the functions of government. So I, I think that those are a big piece. And the ethics provisions range from just ensuring that there's not conflicts of interest in the executive branch, ensuring that there's a codification of the president, um, you know, not releasing his tax returns or, or their tax returns, I should say. And so I, I think that's a big piece. You know, I think going back to Laura's really excellent point about disclosure and the Disclose Act is included in, you know, real time reporting and transparency of campaign disbursements over $10,000. I mean, that is a really significant piece of trying to understand where big amounts of money are coming from, where they're impacting politicians and where they're impacting advocacy groups, because so much of the work of government relies on, you know, external advocates, uh, 501c4s in particular. So, you know, I, I think that there is just so much that needs to be done to ensure that Americans, you know, firmly believe that their government is working on behalf of their interests. And I, and I think that there's a lot um, that we can do to, to get that process started. I really appreciate that response because I think looking at, you know, everything that is happening, um, people are trying to figure out what role can they play because there's at the policy level, there are many things that can be done. I think as um, I, I think that what we found right is that things come very quickly. This is, um, but it feels like it comes very fast, but these are not short term um, attacks, right? That some many of these things on these attacks on democracy have been planned over a long period of time because of dark money and, and not having some of these policies in place. And so it's incumbent upon all of us to push for them. Um, one of the questions that has come from the audience, and um, I guess I'll, I'm going to ask you, Bill, to respond to this one. Um, you know, people are saying, if my senator currently opposes the For the People Act, 
they haven't come out in support of it. What can they do as constituents to put that pressure on them? What are some things that they can do to, what, is, what are the senators behind the scenes? What do they really care about? What mm -hmm. do they wanna hear from their constituents? All right, absolutely. Well, I say, you know, first turn to your First Amendment, look up your right to petition the government for redress of grievances and to peaceably assemble. So we really want people to make noise through the political process in June. And I don't know if uh, the uh, Senator Leader Schumer indicated in the, in the opening remarks, but he is planning to bring this up in June to the Senate floor, right? So now's the time to act and really to energize folks. Uh, so whether it's phone calls or letters, our op-eds or doing uh, events, discussions, you know, protests. I think you want to let the members know and have your voices be heard. And that's something that gets the attention of the members and the staff that work on these issues when we hear from Marylanders or Oregonians or Montanans, right? So that's what we pay attention to as part of our job. Uh, so I think everybody is going to have to be on the record when Leader Schumer brings it up for a vote, but members still have time to decide in June and hear from their constituents and the various groups. So whether it's the League of Women Voters or or voting rights groups, civil rights groups. But again, we work with faith groups on other issues, right? Keep trying to broaden that coalition. Talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends, because democracy really is on the line. This is your chance to get your voices heard, and the members will feel that uh, pressure, good pressure, uh, and that they'll know the constituents want them to vote and support this when it comes up for a vote in June, which is coming up very soon. Thank you. We really appreciate that. Um, you know, we want people to get as loud as possible and to have their voices heard because we know that, you know, this is a participatory democracy. It's for everybody. Um, but we've seen, and Laura, I, I'm going to ask you this next question that has come in because it kind of piggybacks off of Bill. Um, you know, we're an organization that has promoted civil discourse for 100 years, but we did see an attack on our democracy on January 6th. And so, um, and, 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 and this has become so, um, there's been so much tension, right? There was a lot of tension leading up to that moment. How do we forge a new path forward so that we can talk to our fellow, um, you know, Americans who maybe don't have the same opinion as we do? How do we promote civil discourse in this time to, to help educate folks on, on, on this legislation in particular and, and how we can move it forward for people who may not be there or may not understand it? I think, well, um, first it's understanding what this bill does and being able to, to talk to your neighbors about it. And, and you know, the things of setting the minimum standards of, of making it easier to vote of, you know, things like disclosing information about big money over $10,000. Like we should be able to track that. I, you know, it's, it's increasing ethics across the board. You know, everyone I think believes in getting corruption out of government. So being able to talk about this bill but I also think it's connecting it back to what people care about. You know, if you, you look at Dr. Turner talking about education, or if you care about healthcare policy, if you care about improving our environment and protecting our public lands, finding what people care about and connecting it back to why democracy matters. And that if you want your voice heard on that issue, we have to protect the right to vote and we have to clean up our campaign finance system and we have to get more of that government and trust that Allison was talking about. Those are all connected. So I think it's finding that that commonality and connecting those dots for people. And, in, and where the league is so important is you guys are in every community. If it comes from us or it comes from our boss, people sometimes roll their eyes. But if it comes from their neighbor, if it comes from the person who, you know, their kids go to school together, it, it makes it more human. It makes it more tangible and, and really underscores why this is important. This bill affects everything that anyone could care about. You just have to make those connections in your community. Thank you so much. And um, Allison, last question for you. Um, what are you most hopeful about for our democracy right now? Because we talk about a lot of bad things. I kind of want to end on a, on a high note. Yeah. Um, what are you most hopeful about? 
no pressure to, to go out on the, the high note. Um, you know, I, I would have to say that in working on this bill, just recognizing the amazing work of advocates and champions across the country that are so passionate and care about our democracy that exists right now that are working to pass this bill that are organizing and are, you know, eat, eat, sleeping and breathing democracy work. The fact that that already exists in our country, I think should make us feel incredible. And so, yes, there is a, there is an uphill battle ahead of us to get this bill across the finish line. But I think Leader Schumer has made very clear that failure is not an option. And um, I, I am quoting him, uh, so that is not that is not just something I'm trying to impose on him. But you know, I, I think that the fact that there are mechanisms and hardworking people in place that are are willing to do this work, such as all of you participating in this call today on a on a Wednesday, um, it just makes us feel amazing and uh, very hopeful. So that that's what I would say. Thank you. And we really appreciate all of your time. Any last comments from Bill or Laura, Allison, any last remarks that you would like to share with us? Uh, can I throw in one thing just to add on to Allison in terms of being hopeful and on a high note, I do think President Biden is, is highly engaged on this too and has, has pushed this extremely um, uh, aggressively recently. And we were pleased to see, you know, Vice President Harris be designated as leading kind of a new voting rights push. So I think that shows you've got kind of buy-in from the, the president, the executive branch, again, former senators who know how important this is. Uh, so we were pleased to see that yesterday. So we look forward and we're like working in partnership with both President Biden and Vice President Harris uh, to move forward on the voting rights legislation. We're always excited to see a woman spearheading these efforts, I'll say that. <laughs> Laura, any last remarks? Um, I will just say, I, I again, it's been a really hopeful, and I know as a staffer, and I'm sure Allison and Bill feel this too, you know, sometimes we get in the in the weeds on this and we get kind of beat down, and, and then you meet with a group like the league or, you know, um, a lot of the young groups of, of kids and high schoolers and college students who are taking their frustration and really funneling it into um, activism and improving democracy, and then you're right back in it. So I think I have, we've really seen a, a coalition build from the ground up. And um, so I'm hopeful that, you know, there's just a lot of support for this legislation. And I think seeing that activism in the work of our advocates. And I, I especially think of the young ones and the, you know, these teenagers and college students involved in this, it, it really makes me hopeful for the future. Well, thank you. I wanna thank the, the three of you in particular, because I know you've got a lot going on and for taking time out of your day, but also for your commitment to the work. Um, oftentimes people don't know all that goes into working up on the Hill to just keep our, our government and our legislature functioning in the way that it should. You guys don't get nearly enough credit for all that you do. So once again, I just wanna thank you so, so very much for all that you're doing for our democracy and for each one of us. I know it's super hard work. And um, you know, we talk about these challenges as though they're somehow abstract or we see the video from January 6th, but you all were there. You know, you all work in that building. That is your office, that is your, everyday work home. And so we know that this has been incredibly challenging for you as well. And so we just want to extend our thanks and gratitude for everything that you do for us and for our country. So thank you all so, so very much. Um, we are going to move along. Um, we have some remarks, both uh, Senators King and Senator Warnock have some closing remarks for us before we sign off for the day. So um, I'm going to pass it over. Thank you all so much. The League of Women Voters has been a great organization, is a great organization, and has made a tremendous contribution to this country and our democracy over the last hundred years. Uh, in our house, we have a wonderful poster that a friend sent to my wife, Mary, and it's Milwaukee and the vote and has a, a woman and a young girl going in to vote for the first time. It's a vintage poster from the 20s and it's, it's, uh, it just says everything. And what a difference uh, you are making in the country. This is, a, this is a difficult moment for our democracy. 
uh, we really are under assault. And I think the League of Women Voters has a very important role to play in defending the fundamental premise of a vote for every citizen, that the, the vote, voting should be accessible and should be available to all of our citizens. As you know, there's a lot of work going on in Washington on this. And frankly, there's a lot of work that's not so good going on in many of our states designed, I believe, to restrict the franchise and to restrict people's ability to vote. So you have your work cut out for you. It's not 1920, it's 2021, but there are new challenges and there are challenges that I'm sure that you can meet. Thanks for what you've done and thanks especially for what you will do. We're counting on you. Well, hello to the League of Women Voters. The League of Women Voters has helped to define the last 100 years of work uh, from everything from voter registration to voter education, voter access, and advocacy for key democracy reforms. And so thank you so very much for having me today as we all turn to ponder what the next 100 years of democracy reform will look like. Together we can continue to press onwards, working to maintain and defend our nation's foundational democracy for every American. As I've said on the Senate floor and to Georgians in every corner of my state, voting rights is preservative of all other rights. And so we have to do everything we can to preserve the voices of the people in our own democracy. And so at the federal level, know that I will continue pushing the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act to ensure that all eligible voters have reliable access to the ballot box. As you all know, democracy reform benefits all of us by ensuring that our government is of the people, by the people, and for the people. When our elected officials reflect the people they are elected to represent, we are all better off. So thank you again to the League of Women Voters for having me today. Thank you for the work that you do every single day to preserve and strengthen our democracy. And thank you so much for fighting to protect the right to vote. I believe as you do, that your vote is your voice and your voice is your human dignity. I wanna thank all of the senators. I hope all of you feel inspired. Um, and I also wanna thank again, these accomplished staffers that we heard from today, extraordinary individuals in their own right. And my sister in justice, Dr. Turner, um, thank you all for the fantastic discussion on the future of our democracy and the opportunities that we face. We are at such a critical moment in our nation's democracy. And we are encouraged by the momentum that we see for the People Act. We, this month, we know the US Senate will vote on this important bill that will make the promise of democracy real for all of us, not just some. So I am encouraging each of you to call your senators, urge them to vote yes on the For the People Act. Don't just call them once, call them twice, three, four, five times, send letters, smoke signals, I don't care. You need to urge your senators to please, please vote yes on the For the People Act. Our staff is putting a link in the chat. Um, you can also go to lwv.org and click take action to send a letter to your US senators to pass this important legislation to protect our freedom to vote and to make voting safe and accessible for all voters. It's up to us. Nobody is going to save our democracy but us. It is for the people for a reason. We thank you all so much for coming and joining us in this discussion. And we look forward to engaging you in more conversations around For the People Act and everything that we can do to move our democracy forward together. Thank you all. Have a great rest of the afternoon.